Good morning, and welcome to worship with the First United Church of Christ Congregational in Milford, Connecticut, where we praise God who challenges us to live authentically and in love and for one another. We are so glad that you have made it here. If you made it here in person, thank you. We hope that the roads were safe. Everything I've heard is that they were relatively safe. And if you are here uh, through uh, online, live streaming on Local Live, or later through the archive, we are glad that you are here as well. I'm Reverend Adam Eckhart, the senior pastor. It's our second week of using our new live streaming system, locallive.tv. So please bear with us as we continue to learn the ropes. Just a note that the video cameras are mostly pointed here in the chancel area, but could occasionally pick up the first few pews. So if you want to stay out of that, that view, then you can be a, a few pews back. Because I know everybody loves to sit in the first three pews. <laughs> there is a no youth group or confirmation meeting this afternoon. Apparently there's some kind of sporting event later today. I don't know. Um, Choirs are getting uh, back up and started after the um, uh, hiatus from the Omicron surge. Uh, and so you can look in the bulletin insert or online on our website to find out when those different choirs are starting up. But we have our adult choir already started back up, and so we're grateful uh, for that group. Uh, other groups are getting started. There's also a list of some current needs for our food closet, closet which has served uh, 23 families over the last three weeks. So if you feel called to uh, donate to that, please uh, do so. Next Sunday, February 20th, the high school youth group Senior PF is holding a can and bottle drive in the church parking lot after worship. Bring your redeemable bottles and cans from all of that water you're going to drink while you watch the game of course, um, and they'll use all those nickels from the, the bottles and cans, not coddles and bands. Okay, um, bottles and cans uh, to help pay for their mission trip to Ohio in June. On Monday, February 21st at 6.30 p.m., we start the second half of our Bible from Scratch series. We already covered the Old Testament for beginners. Now we're going to cover the New Testament for beginners. And so that's going to be hybrid, both online and in person, in Fellowship Hall, 6.30 on Mondays, beginning February 21st. We'll cover the four biblical gospels, as well as Acts and the letters or the epistles in the New Testament. We're using this book by Donald Griggs, and we have some copies here that you can get for a subsidized price of just $5, or you can get it online or an e-book version of it. Um, and so we hope that you uh, consider taking this chance to understand more about how the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are central to our life as a church and to human history. Today we resume coffee hour after 10 a.m. worship with relief and hope that the decreasing COVID cases continue. So we thank the Riches for hosting coffee hour. We also thank Deborah Rich for being our liturgist this morning, and we thank the adult choir, our ushers, and all the folks who make Sunday morning worship possible. So once again, good morning and welcome to worship. And now let us turn towards one another and greet each other with signs of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Will all who are able please stand for the call to worship? Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Let us rejoice in the love of God and worship our God together in praise and thanksgiving. Let us rejoice in the love of God and worship our God together in prayer, song, and praise.
please join me in the prayer of invocation. O oh God of many blessings, be with us in our joy and in our sorrow. When we have resources, help us reach out lovingly to those in need. And when we lack, help us receive in loving humility from our neighbors. May we strive together for a community where we can all work to eat and live in dignity. Bless each of us here and all who cannot be present with us today. Shower your blessings on our worship now. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our teacher and guide, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. This meditation is based on an essay by Miroslav Volf entitled The Drama of Embrace from his prize-winning book, Exclusion and Embrace. With Valentine's Day tomorrow, we think about romantic love with couples making goo-goo eyes at each other, holding hands or kissing, feeling like they found their one true love. But we're gonna take time now to imagine a broader definition of love, any relationship with mutual affirmation and affection and special connection. Hugs can embrace that more general brand of love and appreciation. Some of us have, as in the words of Ecclesiastes, refrained from embracing over much of the last two years. Some of us, unfortunately, have experienced unhealthy embraces. But now I want you to imagine a good and healthy embrace. Perhaps you have people in your life where a hug with them makes you and them both feel happy and joyful. There are few experiences better than that, a good hug. Miroslav Volf notes that embrace begins actually with the opening of arms, a code of desire for the other. I do not want to be myself only. I want the other to be part of who I am, and I want to be part of the other. I want us to belong to each other. Open arms, then, are a sign that I have created space in myself for the other. Open arms are an invitation. Imagine opening your arms to someone you care about. The section, second action is not very active on the face of it. The second action of a hug is waiting. Waiting to find out if the other will reciprocate. That's crucial for a hug to be a good one, that the other person actually wants to be a part of it. Open arms then make us vulnerable because if the other person doesn't also open their arms then we experience rejection, our love denied by the other. And if someone else opens their arms first, we ponder in that split second. If this is someone we truly want to embrace, someone in whom we will find joy in, appro in approaching and being close to. Waiting distinguishes embrace from invasion because it should only proceed if the other person makes it clear that they want to move forward without pressure or coercion. Both people should consent to embrace if they find that joy by being close to each other. Imagine your loved one opening their arms to you in response to your open arms. Thirdly, when both people accept the invitation, they come in 
and close their arms around each other. This is the goal of embrace when both people are holding and being held at the same time. Tenderly, of course. Too tight of a hug is an act of power instead of an act of equal vulnerability. At no point in the hug do we totally forget who we are or who they are, but we celebrate that we are something wonderful in proximity to each other. We are not islands or disembodied minds. We are humans with the blessings of bodies to use and to honor in relationship with other embodied people. They are wonderful people whom we will never fully understand, but they are precious to us even more because of that inscrutability. So now imagine a good embrace. Fourth, a good hug ends by letting go. We stop the hug, we open the arms and step back. We acknowledge that the embrace is fleeting and we still have our own lives to live. It's nice that the open arms that we started this all with come back again, show up again at the end of embrace, because there may come a time when we invite or accept that invitation to embrace again, especially when we share in the joy of being a close part in each other's lives. So now imagine completing your hug and smiling at the one you've embraced. That's what a good hug generally entails. An embrace like that is what love is about, a two-sided affirmation of joy and care. Embrace shows that two people, in part, belong to one another. It's why, for so many people, a hug is the first thing that they give to each other when they meet up, and the last thing they do before they depart. I hope that if you feel safe doing so, you might get to experience a good hug sometime soon. If not today, maybe tomorrow on Valentine's Day. Jesus tells us about and shows us embrace. In chapter 15 of Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells a story of two sons, one of whom takes his inheritance early while his dad is still alive and running the farm. The son scurries off and spends all of his inheritance on questionable activities. The son and the father are separated by distance and action. In desperation, the son walks back to his dad's farm to ask for a job, assuming he is no longer considered a son to his father. But when his dad sees his son on the horizon, what does he do? He runs to his son and they embrace. Because in the father's eyes, they still belong to each other. There is always love between them. Because there is always love between God and God's people. No, how, no matter how far away they may roam, when they turn back to God, there is embrace. Later in Luke's gospel, Jesus' arms are far, forced open wide on the cross by people who think that they have power over Jesus. On that cross, Jesus, God's son, also opens his arm to us in a sense, in patient love. Suffering because he will not stray from his mission of proclaiming God's love and being God's love in the world. On that cross, Jesus waits for our response. Do we accept his invitation? Do we share in that love? Will we embrace Jesus? We have gathered in a spirit of gratitude. We are grateful that we have resources like food for lunch or to munch on over the football game. We have love to celebrate on Valentine's Day 
and we have heat for cold winter days and nights. Let us reflect on how we can bless each other through Christian discipleship and generosity as this morning's tithes and offerings are given and received. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. Gracious and loving God, who blesses us with so many good gifts, we bring these offerings with the hope of turning poverty to abundance, tears to laughter, sorrow to joy, and exclusion to embrace. May they truly be a blessing. Amen. Please be seated. Today's gospel reading comes from the gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 through 26. Earlier, Jesus has attracted a crowd listening to his speeches on the seashore of the Galilean Sea. He preaches from a boat in one instance so that the crowd uh, can see him and not crush him along the shoreline. Afterwards, Jesus invites Peter to try to catch 
some fish, which he does. And then Jesus calls Peter and then later James, John, and Andrew, who are also fishermen, to be his inner disciples and to catch people. They ponder, what shall we do with a call from Jesus? And they decide to drop everything and follow him. They drop their routines, they drop their nets, they drop their jobs and their livelihoods. Jesus calls another eight disciples to make a full dozen, symbolizing a representative group of Jewish men like the 12 tribes of Israel. In today's reading, Jesus gathers this ragtag group of disciples and gives them a pep talk of sorts as they form into a team. Other people in the crowd hear what Jesus says to the 12 disciples, but it's foremost intended for those people who have already decided to follow Jesus. Matthew and Luke both recall Jesus giving a speech similar to each other. Matthew remembers it happening on the side of a hill or a mountain. Thus, that speech in Matthew we call the Sermon on the Mount. But in Luke's gospel, Luke recalls it happening on a level playing field, if you will. So we call it the Sermon on the Plain in Luke. When we hear the word blessed in these speeches, remember that to be blessed means to be happy and in some sense means to be close to God. So Luke and Matthew recall slightly different content, so listen carefully to what Luke recalls Jesus saying. Listen now for God's word. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. And leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. May God add rich blessings to this reading of holy word, and will you pray with me? O God, your word is bread to us. May we be fed by it as a blessing, but may we not keep it to ourselves May we share your life-giving word with others and to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matt Crossman, a minister at Elm City Vineyard Church, recounts a story from a corporate executive who flew, I think, to a Caribbean island for a conference the conference was taking place near the airport, which meant that all the executives, once they landed, could then see other planes fly in and land. First, some executives came in on commercial flights, and some of the slightly bigger wigs came in on chartered planes. And then the really important CEOs flew in on their own personal planes, at which point, even some of the wealthier executives who flew in on chartered flights said, I've never felt poorer in my whole life. We may understand that sentiment of comparative poverty 
where any person can potentially feel poor if they compare themselves to someone who is richer. Actually, my, one of my sons was reading a book for uh, one of his high school classes. It's a book by Trevor Noah, memoirs, about him growing up in Alexandra, South Africa, and some of the ghettos there. And there is a term given for certain folks. You see, people like to eat hamburgers um, at these little vendors throughout the, the ghettos there. And so most people uh, could only get a burger. But if you had extra money, then you would get a cheeseburger. So if you were, relatively speaking, wealthy within the ghetto, you were called a cheese boy. And so people would say to other folks, oh, I'm not a cheese boy, you're a cheese boy. Other people would say, no, no, you're the cheese boy. You're the one who has enough money to afford cheese on your hamburgers. In some cases, everybody thinks that they are the one who is poor. But Jesus doesn't quite see it that way. He starts his sermon by saying, Blessed are you who are really poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And later Jesus says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Now when our American ears, our Connecticut ears, hear that, and we admit that we are not among the poor folks in that, in that blessing and in that woe, we might say that's pretty harsh. Perhaps we remember that in Matthew's gospel, Jesus qualifies the poverty differently, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we might convince ourselves, oh, well, that can apply to me. I feel poor in spirit. I feel spirit-deprived sometimes. Maybe God is blessing me in that case. But Luke remembers Jesus just saying, blessed are the poor, period. On top of that, some scholars suggest that the word used for poor here doesn't just mean I can only charter a plane or I only have one car or I'm even in debt. This version of poverty means I have nothing to my name. It means dirt poor. In conjunction with the next two blessing descriptions, it's part of this lack of material resources, of food, even of emotional stability. Jesus is talking about possessionless, penniless, foodless, hopeless people. David Brooks recently wrote, after ISIS launched a series of deadly attacks against Egyptian Christians, some Americans at Fuller Theological Seminary wanted to hold a memorial service. But the Egyptian students there said, in effect, what are you talking about? This is a cause for celebration. This is about acknowledging what it means to live as a Christian in a context in which you have the privilege of martyrdom. That idea was foreign to most of the American Christians but the Egyptians led a celebratory service. Jesus not only blesses those who are without solid footings and resources and in happiness, but Jesus also blesses those who suffer because of him, because of following him. Jesus says, if you're poor, hungry, weeping, or persecuted in my name, then you are blessed. And this all seems very foreign to us. It makes sense, though, to his disciples, because they have just left their lives to follow Jesus without any certain source of income, without any certainty that they will be approved of for their message. Later on, they get disparaged for associating with Jesus. Yes, most of them abandon him for a while but then they come back and form the church. And many of them down the line are martyred for following Jesus. They need that assurance that their suffering and their sacrifice will not be in vain. Jesus tells them that God will be close to them so that in their souls they know that even if on the outside it feels like they have been cursed, they're actually being blessed by God. 
on account of what they give up for Jesus. Then Jesus turns to those inverse situations, those of you who are rich, those of you who have food, those of you who have reason to laugh, those of you who get pats on the back from people who listen to you and love what you say. Woe to you, Jesus says, if you know me, if you have heard my call, but if you sacrifice nothing for me, then that stuff and that praise is all you're going to get. That, plus hunger and tears down the road, hunger and tears of empty lives. Have fun with that, Jesus tells us. Jesus, harsh, unvarnished, gospel. In our world, though, where people die every day because they do not even have the absolute minimum of nutrition or safety to live. In our world, then anyone with more than that bare minimum has already gotten their blessing. We who can eke by and more have the privilege and the opportunity and the Christian responsibility to try and do something about those who can't get by. God promises to be with those who hunger and mourn. But I believe that God prefers it if God is with it through people who care for one another as the body of Christ. In this world where people still die or are intensely persecuted for their beliefs or their identity, Christians in Egypt and in India, Muslims in India, Muslim Uyghurs in China, Muslim Rohingyas in Myanmar, just to name a few international examples, then we who have religious freedoms as a right in this country also have the privilege and the opportunity to do something. God blesses those who are persecuted. But Jesus, we remember, died on a cross in part to reveal the tragic insanity of violent persecution. Jesus' death is a statement about how we should not live persecuting one another for our beliefs. An integral part of Christian discipleship is to defy that narrative out there that we have earned our blessings, our material blessings. Where God is sovereign, where God is creator of the ends of the earth, everything is a gift from God, is a grace. Resources are gifts, food is a gift, joy is a gift, community is a gift. Understanding one another and solidarity are gifts. Sacrifices that we make are gifts. Love is most certainly a gift from God. The words of Jesus are a gift to us. These words of Jesus from today are a gift. This time that we have on this earth, the time that we share together, is a gift. Jesus' woes reveal that the worst thing that humans can do is to assume that they have a special right to do to something over other people. The worst thing that humans can do is to protect their privileges. The best thing, however, that people can do is to live together in love, to share resources so that the kingdom of God is alive here and now, and Jesus has nobody to woe because everybody is blessed by taking care of each other. God's gifts of resources and food, joy and community, solidarity and even good hugs, these are given to be shared and celebrated. When I saw this was the reading for this week, I said to myself, I'm probably not going to meet the most popular preacher for preaching about this for telling people that their blessing depends in no small part about how we give away our privilege and share our resources. But like Jesus said, it's not a disciple's job just to get pats on the back or fist bumps for being one who gives comforting words. It's a disciple's job to share just plain, sometimes harsh 
gospel truth. But the good news is that Jesus knows that we need to hear such truth, and he does not back away from telling us that unvarnished and harsh, but life-transforming good news. Jesus tells us what it means to really live. And he doesn't just tell us that. He doesn't just tell us that poverty and persecution are blessings. He also then receives that blessing upon himself on the cross with arms wide open, inviting us to embrace him through embracing those he loves in the world today. So thanks be to God. Amen. Let us now join our hearts in a spirit of prayer. O God, you dispense your blessing and your love upon all creation. You declared that this creation is good. Then you witnessed the fall and the need that we have for redemption. We pray that you bless those who have given their lives to declare your love that demands justice and righteousness. We pray that you bless those who know utter need because of hungry bellies, because of emotional valleys, because of a lack of shelter or other resources. We pray that you bless us to move out of the shadows of pride and greed, to live into your good news together, where all are fed and sheltered and honored, where we help each other because you created us and saved us and provide enough for all. We pray today amid protests and tensions over COVID rules, or rules about masks and vaccines, guide leaders and cities and schools and churches and other institutions to make wise decisions. Oh God, bless those who have grown tired of COVID rules and bless those who have grown tired of those who have grown tired of COVID rules. We pray, O oh God, for the people and country of Ukraine as warnings ring out that Russia may soon invade. Be with the military and leaders all around the region. Be with U.S. troops that have been sent nearby, poised to follow orders. Bless, O oh God, peacemakers to do their work to promote the welfare of civilians, innocent civilians, who may be devastated by war. We thank you, God, for falling numbers of COVID cases. We pray that may continue. And through the hard work of so many people in medical fields, in public health, in schools, and so many other places, we might be able to embrace again we pray, O oh God, for those who are hurting in body or in spirit, as we name some now aloud. If it is your will, O oh God, grant them your healing embrace. And we mourn, O oh God, with those who mourn the death of loved ones, as we name some now. We embrace the family and friends of Ray Auger, who recently died. Oh God, we have faith that you have embraced in your everlasting arms those who have passed. Embrace with hope those who mourn. Embrace us now in your universal love, a love that counts each soul in life as precious. Help us to embrace each other and our needs so that we might be your beloved community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
May the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the embrace of the Holy Spirit be with us both now and forevermore. Amen.